So I want to introduce everyone to uh, second language acquisition. Um, of course, I should probably introduce myself first. So um, it's nice to meet you. Uh, up here in Japanese, it says Yoroshiku onegaishimasu, which means nice to meet you in Japanese. My name is uh, Malia Smith, and I'm an English language teacher um, in Japan. Um, I studied my master's uh, in applied linguistics at Georgia State University, um, and I'm also a language enthusiast. And right now, I'm teaching at three high schools. One is an academic school here in Japan. Another is an all boys school. And then the third one is a special needs school. So um, the other, the special needs school is all ages, uh, but then the, the other two are high schools. So um, I definitely have a large range of students that I teach. Um, and then on top of that, uh, on the weekends, I do volunteer to teach uh, uh, elderly students. So some of my students, um, actually I do, I think my oldest student is 95 years old. So, so I, I, I'm teaching English across the board. So yeah, it's nice to meet everyone. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump into what is second language acquisition. Um, let's see. We go. So second language acquisition, right? It's the process of learning another language. So it can occur while learning a first language or after a first language is established, right? Um, just a very quick sort of definition of that. Um, so I do want to ask uh, as a preliminary question, how many of you guys have experience with learning a second language? I imagine most of the students here have, since this is an international school, correct? So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, before we get in, though, I, I do want to mention some key terms uh, that you will hear during my presentation. So you're going to hear target language, right? And target language is, as it sounds, it's the language that you aim to learn. And then you're also going to have interlanguage. And interlanguage is, um, so when, when you have your uh, like native language and then you have your target language, so what, what you're going to have is some sort of mix in between, right? you're gonna bring some pieces of your native language into the target language that you're learning. So that's gonna be that interlanguage, that sort of creation that you have that's in between. Um, you also have language input and output. This will be very important for this presentation. Input is, it's very basic. It's what you're getting in, what you're hearing um, and things like that. Output is what you're saying. And then this one, uh, a lot of people, have a hard time pronouncing this one, I, even I did, uh, but it's interlocutor and um, an interlocutor is a person that's taking part in a conversation. So you're gonna have, you know, it could be one person, it can be everyone that's in the conversation. And then a uh, quick reminder, uh oh, uh, that first language is going to be shortened to L1. Second language will be shortened to L2 for the sake of, um, I guess, like smoothness in this uh, presentation. So L1, L2. All right, so some key questions. So uh, these are things that people who um, study, uh, I guess, second language acquisition or linguistics, they, this is kind of the main questions that they ask themselves. So starting off, um, is there a cutoff time for language learning aptitude? So language learning aptitude is like your, your ability to learn a language, right? Um, so what they're trying to ask is, uh, you know, is there a certain age in which we begin to struggle with learning a foreign, foreign language? 
And of course I would argue not because one of my oldest students again is 95 years old. So we still have the ability to learn you know, language, of course, even when we're older, that's my opinion. But there's also uh, the other question is, are there differences between adult language learners and child language learners in terms of learning an L2? So our L2 student or our children more, do they have more of the ability to learn language faster than adults or vice versa, or is it a mix? Um, we also have, is learning an L2 the same as learning an L1, right? Um, does it work the same way? Should we follow the same patterns as we did when we learned an L1? And do we even remember, you know, how we even learned our first language? Probably not, right? And then the other is, can a person's environment affect how they learn a second language? So what, what sort of factors that are happening on the outside, what factors are affecting our ability to learn um, a second language? And what role does a person's first language play in the process of learning a second language? Does it help us learn a second language or does it make it harder for us to learn a second language? The fact that we have a sort of set uh, first language. We, we sometimes bring in rules from our first language into a second language that just don't work. So, yeah. All right, so let's just get into some theories. So some early theories of uh, second language acquisition would be behaviorism. Uh, behaviorists, believe that people learn a second language through imitation, practice, feedback, and habit formation, right? So in this case, there's almost like a formula to it. So you have a stimulus plus practice plus reinforcement, which builds habit formation, which we believe, or which they believe um, causes language development. So for example, here I have for the input, Right, you're gonna hear your teacher say, repeat after me, may I have a pen, right? And that's the stimulus. And then you produce an output, may I have a pen? That's the practice. And then say your teacher gives you the pen, that's reinforcement, showing that you did say that correctly. And they say habit is formed, right? This was really popular um, in second language ac acquisition during the 40s uh, throughout the early 1970s. This was the, the main way that people believed that um, we learned a second language. Um, and this was really popular, especially in the US, uh, in like the military. This is how they would teach um, soldiers how to speak, you know, uh, Vietnamese and things like that. Um, yeah, so this is like, for example, the audio lingual method, which you've probably seen before if you've listened to any language tapes, right? They constantly make you repeat what they say and you just keep repeating until you remember, right? So behaviors believe this is how we learn a second language. So, all right, this is some behavior saying like, wow, learning a second language is as simple as one, two, three. Now I'm off to become a master polyglot, travel the world, get a foreign girlfriend and... Right, so what we're trying to get at now as uh, second language researchers is that this doesn't exactly help everyone. This the, it, Behaviorism is not necessarily the right approach to learning a second language, right? So here are some criticisms to this theory. Um, for one, they say it's one dimensional. Um, there's not much to it. It really tries to simplify a very complicated process that happens in the brain. Um, it also doesn't account for individual differences. For example, you know, maybe some people really struggle with um, listening. So they might not be able to really take in that input, but does that mean they're terrible language learners? You know, maybe there's a different approach that they need to take. Um, 
And then we have uh, the other one is linguistic structure is stored in the brain varies between learners. So not everyone is going to take in that full sentence and sort of uh, memorize it exactly. Um, they're probably, some people have different ways in which they memorize these sentences and how they work. Um, and the biggest thing is that a lot of the research for this theory was that um, it was conducted on animals. Uh, and these scientists just assumed that they can just apply this research to humans as well. But that's not very useful because humans don't, our, our level of language or understanding of language is completely different from animals, right? We have a much more complicated system of language. So those are some of the main, main issues with uh, behaviorism. So actually I was curious, um, uh, let's see, let me try to open this up a little bit more, but yeah, I was actually curious, I, did anyone learn uh, language through this sort of audio lingual method where you have a teacher that says, repeat after me, can I have a pen? And then you go, can I have a pen? Did you guys learn anything like that or learn English or any other language like that in high school or in different academic settings? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe I got some nods. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually really common. And uh, I will say that this is a big um, sort of method that they use here in Japan. And to be honest, it's very outdated. It's very outdated and it's not really useful for my students. So I'll get into that with the other theories, the newer theories that um, we uh, study in second language acquisition. Okay, so here are some contemporary theories to SLA. So after the behavior theory kind of blew up, we, we started to see um, an innate uh, perspective, right? And this became popular in the 1980s. Um, I will go into each of these in detail because they're kind of the meat of this uh, discussion, but um, we start to see new things coming, coming in. So with the innatist perspective in the 1980s, we have some major names like Noam Chomsky. You may have heard of Noam Chomsky, but he's one of the biggest names in linguistics for sure. Um, we also have Stephen Krashen, and uh, some of the main sort of themes in the innatist perspective is this idea of universal grammar, uh, the monitor model and comprehensible inputs, um, which I'll go into detail in a bit. Uh, you also have that the main concept of the innatist perspective is that learning a language is natural for us, right? They believe that it, we have a built-in sort of ability to learn a language. Um, with a cognitive perspective, this kind of goes into the uh, 1990s and onwards, and it's still very much uh, studied and, and a lot of uh, researchers really push for this cognitive uh, perspective. They believe in this thing called information processing, declarative and procedural knowledge, and their main thought is that language or learning a language is conscious and reasoned, right? a conscious and reasoned thinking process. And then we have social cultural theory, which is more much newer and still being studied. Um, and this is why now with English language classes, we're starting to see more discussion based language classes, right? Um, so we have Vygotsky and Meryl Swain are some of the main people in there. Um, they believe in uh, these concepts of zone of proximal development, uh, comprehensible outputs, and they believe that learning a language is social and meaning based. So let's let's get into each of these in detail. So with the innatist perspective, right? Um, I talked about Noam Chomsky. Uh, again, he's, he is considered to be the father of modern linguistics. Um, 
and he's still alive and still got, you know, he's still kicking and coming up with new theories. So he's great. But um, so he came up with this idea for L1. This is our first, he was trying to understand first language uh, acquisition, how children learn um, a language. And he asked himself, he, he came up with this idea called the poverty of stimulus. And basically he asked himself, you know, how are children able to learn English or learn a language so quickly uh, without any formal instruction? No one's telling them how to, learn, how to do certain things. I mean, of course, children do learn uh, pieces of language when they're little, but a lot of this is stuff that they pick up on their own, right? For example, um, with uh, when children start to sort of babble and like make little sounds like goo goo and gaga kind of, you know, no one's telling them to do that. They're picking that up on their own. And what's interesting is that what they're doing when they make this sort of babbling noise is they're practicing the vowels or the sounds that they're hearing from the adults around them. They're not just saying nothing, that it's a natural process for them to practice those sounds. No one told them to do that. It's just this sort of innate thing that, that children do. And eventually they start to develop into, into words and then into sentences. So uh, what's interesting is that there are certain sounds or vowels that children make that differ between languages. Um, so that's another interesting thing uh, about that. But again, he said the, the amount of linguistic data that children are exposed to is insufficient to account for every feature in their language. So he believes that Within the brain, every child has this sort of language acquisition device. He calls it an LAD. Um, he, it can also be, also be known as universal grammar. So there's a sort of built-in structure within our brains when we're kids that help us learn language. Um, he started to push for this critical period hypothesis where he believes that after a certain point, um, this sort of LAD becomes difficult to tap into. So many researchers argue about which age that is. Um, some say seven, some say 10, some say early adolescence. It's kind of uh, still a work in progress. Um, but again, I, I'm, maybe you've heard that children are amazing language learners, right? or that you should learn English as early as possible so that when you're older, you know, you'll, you'll be completely fluent in English. It's best to learn it early. So he's the one who really first came out with this idea. Um, and the reason why he did that is because um, there was research uh, done on children who were severely abused for one, ones that uh, weren't exposed to language. Like there was um, a little girl who was trapped in a basement by her dad. No one was allowed to speak to her. No one was allowed to talk to her. Um, and so she was never around any language. So when they finally rescued her and um, tried to teach her English, she she never really fully grasped it. She got pieces of it, but she was never really fluent in a language. I mean, she severely struggled with learning after a certain age. So this is where they started to think, okay, there's a certain period in which we can't learn a language or it becomes extremely difficult. We need to practice it at a certain age in order to kind of keep that LAD alive in our head, so. Um, so this is what Noam Chomsky thought. Uh, and yeah, so getting into the innatist perspective or continuing with it, we have Stephen Krashton um, who said, okay, like uh, I, those, these ideas that Chomsky had were great, but they were only for, uh, I guess, for the first language, for learning our first language. 
Stephen Krashen said, I want to take this idea and I want to apply it to learning a second language. So he came up with five hypotheses. Um, the first one being uh, the acquisition learning hypothesis. He's saying that learning is different from acquisition. Learning is, um, so he's saying again, it's far more language is acquired than learned. So what he's trying to say is we're not formally taught, uh, we acquire more language than we are formally taught. Um, so for example, as children, again, we're not formally taught anything with language for the most part. For the most part, we acquire a lot of it. So he believes that there's also the, there's this natural order hypothesis, meaning that language rules are acquired in a predictable order. So we may learn how to use the progressive like ING, like I'm going somewhere first before we fully acquire past tense. Uh, the ED ending, right? So he wants to really stress that the rules that are easiest to state uh, or the easiest to say are not, necessar not, not necessarily the first to be acquired. So go, again, going back to English ED ending, past tense, right? Seems easy enough, but actually it's, it's really difficult. I, I find that a lot of my students struggle with the ED ending with uh, English because there are many exceptions to that rule and it does take time to fully use that ED ending or for example the S ending for example runs or eats um, just because it's easy to state you just add the S uh, it's not necessarily the first to be acquired because many students don't understand when it's appropriate to use runs or eats in a sentence. Um, we also have the monster hypothesis, which is that acquired language is utilized in spontaneous conversation. Meaning if you've acquired a language, you can use it anytime, all the time. It's, you got it, it's there. But learn language is the actual rules and patterns that you use to edit or monitor something. Uh, monitor your speech. So this, the learn language is what you haven't fully 100% developed yet. It's what you're in the process of learning. Acquired is what you know. You don't even have to think about it. Um, so yeah, and then uh, acquisition, we have the comprehensible input hypothesis, meaning that acquisition occurs when one is exposed to language that is comprehensible and contains I plus one, which means uh, language that's one step beyond the language that we've already acquired. So for example, we don't learn by just having everything thrown at us, having all this input coming at us. We don't learn a language like in, in that way. We still need to understand a certain amount of that uh, and just a little bit like a step above what we understand to be able to acquire it. For example, if you're ever reading a, a book in a different language or in, a newspaper in English, for example, sometimes you'll have a sentence that uh, you will understand 60% of, and then you have some words that you don't quite understand. Well, that 60% is going to be uh, the I, that's what you know, and the plus one is what you don't know. So because they're kind of together, it's it's kind of giving you like a sort of ladder or some sort of step to be able to understand the full thing. I hope that makes sense. So um, again, uh, comprehensible input is important. We don't just learn by watching TV in a language that we want to learn and just getting hit with all this input. We still need to understand a good chunk of it to be able to learn. So yeah. Um, and then we also have the effective filter hypothesis, meaning that, uh, so it says the effective filter is a metaphorical barrier preventing acquisition, even if appropriate input is there. 
So this is going into like anxiety, attitude, et cetera. So we're not always going to be able to like be the best language learners every day and keep that same consistency. Some days we're gonna have our effective filter will be up. We'll have anxiety, stress, maybe we didn't sleep. So that's going to be that barrier that's preventing acquisition. Um, so that's where that comes from and yeah. So I do want to take a quick break. I know that I kind of just threw a lot at you guys. So maybe we should probably stop and kind of uh, talk about it or think about it. So I do want to, I hope this is okay if we can get into groups and kind of consider some of these theories that I proposed, the behaviorism and the, mon uh, the monitor model from Krashen. And I want you to kind of discuss, do any of these things feel intuitively convincing? Like, do any of these things, have you had any sort of experience with any of these things that you can apply um, to your life now? And do any of these things seem not so right? So I think we can do that. Maybe breakout rooms of group, uh, groups of two or three people. Actually, I would like to uh, interject uh, real quick, uh, if you don't mind, Ms. Smith, that yeah. uh, this might not be an easy uh, activity as our students are, you know, from all over, our participants are from all over the world, and uh, some of them yeah. are also in different time zones. So mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure whether uh, this practice would be feasible, except that uh, we would like to uh, have our students get somewhat involved and uh, yeah. voice some opinions and ask questions, uh, make some comments. And this is exactly what uh, Ms. Mel Smith uh, wants us to do, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get a little uh, more closely involved and uh, mm. provide some input. <laughs> uh, we're talking about language learning and language acquisition. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, without our input, then we might feel a little lost. So uh, go ahead, uh, uh, going into the reactions uh, at the very bottom of your horizontal menu where you will see uh, a way to, uh, with a hand icon, to uh, raise your hand and let us know that uh, you want to make a comment and uh, ask some some questions. Uh, something that I would like to say real quick, uh, Miss Smith, is uh, personally I've been a teacher of uh, second language acquisition. Actually, uh, English as a second language for the last 33 years. It's been a long time wow. before you were even born. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, okay. as we're talking about some of the theories behind this uh, practice of teaching English as a second language or English as a foreign language, personally, the most uh, cumbersome issue I've had to deal with is uh, what uh, Stephen Krashen calls the affective filter. This one I found out is really critical, fundamental, because what happens to put that in, a, uh, in an easier way to uh, understand, uh, you are a native of a certain language and all of a sudden, I'm calling that all of a sudden because of uh, life circumstances, you end up with an obligation to learn English, but you're not comfortable. Uh, one thing that mm -hmm. I have found, for example, if we consider languages like uh, Spanish, where all the uh, uh, vowel sounds are typical, you know, A, E, E, O, U, well, exactly what you see, that's exactly what you're going to say. Uh, it happens also more or less the same way in French. Uh, but when it comes to uh, phonemes, for example, combination of some uh, 
uh, vowels in English. It's a uh, all different ball game. So some English learners feel naturally intimidated. That's exactly what Stephen questions a theory of affective filter is all about. So those students, mm -hmm. if they don't feel comfortable, pretty much uh, like Stephen looks at it, no matter how much input you provide, well, you're not going to get any output from that student because he or she is afraid. If the student is afraid, there is no English learning process that's going right. to take off. Uh, to whatever Absolutely. extent we uh, consider. There might be some little language learning, but uh, because of uh, the factor of affective filter, uh, the student, the learner is going to get very, very little, which is a reason why, from my personal experience, I have felt bad, terribly bad for those students when they are uncomfortable uh, we are in the United States, for example, where they force immigrants to take standardized tests, which is to me mm -hmm. a, a killer because the student doesn't know the very basic of the language. Now you come with an obligation to coerce them, to force them to get to a very high metacognitive levels of language yes. learning and the student at some point in time gets lost completely as a human and most of these people unfortunately they end up being becoming criminals because they are so afraid of uh, life in general afraid of society so they consider they are just not normal humans and they just uh, verse into uh, committing crimes, things of that sort. So I don't know uh, what's uh, your uh, your stand, your reading of this is uh, on your end, uh, Miss Smith. But before I get uh, your response, let's go quickly to one of our participants who is raising hands, Jose Esono uh, Obama. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, let let's hear from you. Yeah, well, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, it's not a question, my own uh, comment. What I want to say, just a, like a comment. Um, I'm from Equatorial Guinea, and we do speak uh, uh, French, I mean, Spanish is our official language. But uh, let me um, outline this thing uh, learning a second language. It's not, it's not very easy at all. No. <laughs> no. It's not easy. Um, uh, let's put in place that you are from, uh, you speak a different language, which means you speak Spanish and you try to learn English. At time, it's going to be something very, very difficult. And mostly when you try to learn online, because when you learn, you when you have physical classes, not like learning online. And when I mean the, your country, I mean your interest, people that are around you do speak the language that you are learning actually, that one is gonna help you for you to develop your language learning and for you to at least uh know what uh, the language that you are learning is all about. But unfortunately, I learn English in a different country which they do speak English. But by when back home, I encountered so many difficulties because I was in a place that <laughs> no one was speaking English. Everybody mm -hmm. was just there speaking Spanish, every time every time and you almost forget everything everything that you have already already learned so yeah. those are some different challenges that we we have in our daily learning thank you thank you very much for your input uh, jose uh, uh, Ms. Smith. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've been in Japan for a year and a half. And I guess like when I was in uh, studying language and studying um, intercultural communication, of course, I'm learning about all these experiences through a book. But um, when I moved here and actually experienced the difficulties of um, learning a language, especially because I'm I'm in uh, I live in the in the countryside of Japan. I don't live in the city. I'm one of five foreigners in my city. You know, I know all the all the foreigners, and there's only four other foreigners. So, um, yeah, the difficulty of of having you know, being surrounded by people who only speak Japanese can be hard. I mean, on one end, you do learn Japanese fairly quickly because you have to. Um, but uh, again, you know, there is that effective filter that that appears through anxiety and stress. You know, not every day I'm able to take in the Japanese language and understand it. There are some days where I have less stress, my effective filter is down and you know, I'm able to do just fine. I'm like a miracle, uh, a miracle with like Japanese. But then there's some days where I just forget the most basic Japanese and things that I felt like I had already acquired. Um, but depending on the context, you know. Yes. So yeah, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, you don't actually know how how much of a struggle intercultural communication is until you're in a country where you do not speak the majority language. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, and then I I wanted to before uh, we move forward I I did want to say um, you know with the the whole issue of crime and things like that. Uh, from people who come in not knowing uh, the language of the majority in the country that they're in, it's, it is, there is a, such an unfair advantage uh, when you do move to a foreign country. There's not a lot of uh, systems put in place mm -hmm. um, to help people in these countries who are trying to uh, migrate into or assimilate into that culture. And um you know japan is actually very similar because it is a very homogenous country and there are only japanese people here mostly so there are a lot of issues that i've seen with just daily tasks that uh, are not in favor of helping foreigners uh immigrate um and i can totally see why uh it can be overwhelming for foreigners why they might feel you know sort of discriminated against or feel less than i guess in these kinds of countries or overwhelmed um when they get you know i guess like a as you were saying like an exam where it's sort of like standardized tests and it's just not it's not how we should be <laughs> handling foreigners <laughs> So it's really bad in America too, of course. Anyway, thank you. Uh, did anyone want to say anything else before I move forward? Uh, let's allow uh, Adjo, Kiko, Victoria, Clement to uh, say something. Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope the floor is yours at this time. Victoria? Uh, Victoria has raised hands, but uh, the audio doesn't seem to respond. So let's switch then to Steve Calpi. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, there I, we, yeah, go. <laughs> we can hear you now. Yes. I'm from an English English background, and in where I come from, I, I was born in Trinidad. Where I come from, we have Spanish, French, and 
because we are located so near to the like Venezuelan places like that. Um, what I found about French, you have to submerge yourself in an environment to hear the sound, the language each day for a period of time. And it's difficult to learn by a book or, or just hearing a video or something like that. You have to see the signs on the street, talk to people. And to me, that's the best way to learn the language and learn the linguistic parts of it. They, they, you know, so um, that has that has done well for me. Where I'm located now in the U.S. Virgin Islands, we do a lot of Spanish and a lot more uh, Creole. Creole is a very different language for me. They because <laughs> like a broken broken Spanish. So um, mm -hmm. although I'm submerged with the people who speak Creole daily. It's uh, there's no way to learn it like you know, like a, from a book or anything like that. So uh, that's my that's my challenge with uh, learning this new language. Hmm. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> you may proceed, you. Ms. Smith, as uh, we might be running out of time. So let's. Oh yeah, you're right. Oh no, I just realized. So um, yeah, uh, actually, you know, I do want to get into what Steve said um, because uh, more recent second language um, theories kind of talk about this, about uh, immer immersion and things like that. So um, I think what I'll do since we're running out of time is I'll just skip the cognitive and go straight to the socio-cultural perspective, which is what Steve was talking about. So, um, so this is more of a recent uh, sort of study. There, people really are strongly um, sort of researching the socio-cultural perspective, and people who are strong socio-culturalists, I guess, uh, they believe that language is is a social mechanism. Therefore, we learn through social interactions, right? So we don't just learn through formal, like looking at a book and having people instruct us. We learn by being in a zone of what they call proximal development, where um, we're getting, let's see, in this little graph here, you should be able to see um, that that circle on the outside, it's that uh, it's the task that we can't do without assistance. What, getting a little further, it's a task that we can do with assistance of another person. Um, and then in the center here is a task that uh, learners can do without assistance. So what they're trying to get at is that we learn through having conversations with someone who might be a master or maybe more advanced in that in our target language. And when we're in that, we can kind of use that interaction to sort of monitor how our language is coming out. We need that sort of zone of proximal development. And they believe that speaking and thinking is actually interwoven. Um, so this development again comes from social interactions. And then uh, Meryl Swain uh, is actually really big on output. She thinks that it's not really input that we learn uh, language. We need to put out language in order to fully acquire it. Acquire it. We need to practice it. We need to say it out loud. We need to be in many different contexts to, to sort of put the pieces of the input we have together. We need to do that. And that's how we learn. Um, you know, it's not enough, for example, like if you think about it with math, right? I mean, People often don't equate language to math, but when you really think about it, 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 it is a, a mathematical process in a way, a scientific process in a way. So we can't just get by with math by memorizing every, you know, how to multiply by six and 10 and 20 and all of that. You can't just get by with math with that, that you don't become a master at math with just memorizing those things, your times tables or formulas. You have to memorize them, but you also have to know how to use them. You have to know how to 
you know, piece it together. Um, and so that's where the output comes in. That's how uh, a lot of social culturalists think that we learn language. And um, I guess, spoiler alert, uh, I definitely am a huge advocate for social cultural theory um, and language learning. And I believe that uh, my Japanese students really struggle with uh, learning English because it is so, they do follow such a behavior, behaviorist perspective in our classrooms and we don't focus on communication um, as much. I do think that more communicative classes are the way to go in order to learn English. So again, we need a mean, uh, it says here that Learners benefit most from output when they're engaged in communicative tasks that require them to use language for meaningful purposes. We need meaning behind language in order for it to stick. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, but I, I certainly uh, agree with the social culturalist uh, perspective. And yeah, so we can do a quick discussion since we are running out of time. Um, and again, I'm so sorry that I wasn't so great at managing the time, but um, yeah, uh, now that we kind of talked about it briefly, I wanted to ask you guys, you know, how do you think we learn a second language? You know, what's your experience with it? I would love to hear. We've heard some from a few people, but you know, if you have more to say on it, I'd love to hear it. Then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, uh, Miss uh, Mel Smith is now expecting your input, uh, your <laughs> participation. Uh, whether you want to uh, raise hands electronically or if you want to, well, let's say, go to the chat uh, line and uh, uh, provide some input of your own. So go ahead, uh, right at this time, and do so. And if you are late, let me remind you, uh, we have uh, Miss Mel Smith. Uh, she is an expert and teacher currently in Japan. And uh, she is talking to us about uh, English as a second language. Uh, there are two components uh, into this. Uh, the uh, uh, language acquisition uh, and then the language learning. There are two. Uh, separate processes, even if uh, the two happen to uh, overlap each other, but uh, they are two separate uh, entities when it comes to uh, uh, the ability to uh, learn and eventually master a language. We are now in the field of uh, English language, uh, whether you look at it uh, as, as teacher, as uh, a student, uh, no matter what, so we are expecting your comments at this time. Uh, Ajo, Kiko, Victoria, Clement still has hand up, uh, but uh, there seems to be uh, an audio issue at uh, the end of that participant. Let's give it a try a second time. Uh, Ajo, if you want to uh, jump in, we are ready for you. Ajo Kiko, but the participant is there, but uh, uh, there is no <laughs> audio input on that end. Uh, I, I don't know what you think, uh, Miss Smith, about uh, the uh, cut off time for language learning. I remember you mentioned your older student is uh, 95 years. Uh, 95 years old. So uh, what do you get from that student? Is there any uh, effective issue? Is that student uh, doing well compared to other students you happen to be interacting with? Uh, tell us something about that uh, uh, topic of uh, cut off time for language mm. learning. So I, I do believe that there is a certain time, uh, a certain cutoff time where it becomes more difficult. I do agree with that. Um, I do think that earlier is better, but 
that's not to say that uh, that doesn't account for, again, individual differences, because there are some people who are more apt to learning a language than others. I'm not sure why. I've seen it myself. There's some people who just can pick it up. They don't have to practice. They don't, you know, they can read the word and it's in there. And I don't know why that's, why that, I'm jealous, honestly. <laughs> um, I'm really jealous, but so I will say um, with my oldest student, uh, you know, his English is great. He's, his English is really wonderful. Um, and I'm always surprised uh, because he'll be quiet for a very long time in class. You know, he won't communicate. And then all of a sudden, like, it seems like he it's didn't gross. understand what was said. And then all of a sudden it just all comes gross. out and it's great English. So I don't know, <laughs> maybe it takes him some time to process it, but when he's ready, it's, it's great, you know? So I, and I think that it's great that he's doing that because, um, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, you should practice your memory constantly yes. because that will keep you young. That will keep your mind young. Um, in fact, there's a correlation between um, mono, monolingual people who only speak one language and, and dementia. You know, people have lower rates of dementia when they uh, are bilingual, surprisingly. Um, because you know it's a it's it's almost like an exercise for your brain for your memory. I'm not sure whether there is any science behind this thinking, but uh, at least we <laughs> go through the uh, concept of natural meta linguistic skills to uh, assume mm. or believe that uh, some people are just not made to uh, learn language. It's not just language. I know of people who uh, pretty much like you mentioned earlier, uh, get the language quickly and they blossom, you know, in a matter of uh, seconds, mm. they become quite able to produce language. But uh, some others uh, can't, no matter how much input they get, no matter what uh, the setting, the environment uh, is made of. Uh, some uh, uh, people do have an issue to uh, learn language. Of course, it's not just about language. We can consider, you know, any other field. Uh, yes, we know about fighting, for example, to, to learn a um, keyboard. No. To play I just heard about it. And uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't click. <laughs> and some people have issue mm -hmm. to, uh, let's say, uh, understand orientation, even if they are using a GPS, they become easily confused about uh, directions. Mm -hmm. It's just about the type of metacognitive abilities that uh, some people have. Uh, they work in some fields and they don't in some others. So, that's uh, the way I uh, would uh, personally understand why some people get the language easily and some are just uh, struggling uh, every day. Uh, we have, uh, there was a request from uh, uh, Chris Akote uh, asking us uh, for permission to ask questions, but I did tell that student that participant to go ahead and ask the question, but then uh, the participant has disappeared. Uh, let's mm -hmm. see on the, uh, that was on the chat line, but uh, among us, I have another hand that is up. I don't see a name, but let's try now with uh, Frank Perry. If uh, your audio is uh, on Frank, uh, go ahead. All right. Um, thank you uh, for the for that uh, presentation. And uh, yes, um, yeah. So we understand that learning is um, a process, and uh, it's a difficult, more especially to learn another language. So what should we do? I don't know if I I didn't get you right. I don't know if you mentioned that. But what should we do for someone to uh, learn the second language fast or to learn it easily? 
<laughs> what can someone do? Hmm. As far yeah, as yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, that question, it, there's no real straight answer because, and in, in my opinion, there's no straight answer because um, the way that people process language on an individual level varies. Um, so for me personally, uh, formal instruction through a book or through study, like trying to memorize words, it doesn't really work for me. What works for me is communication, meaning and having conversations. I find that that's how I learn a language is through immersion. Um, however, there are students that I have who do not learn in that way, um, who are shy, who aren't social, and they learn through reading and writing and formal instruction. So again, I think with that is, if you want to learn a foreign language, uh, my best sort of advice is to just try as many different ways as possible until you find something that works for you individually. Um, but again, I'm a huge advocate for communication, for dialogue, for discussion, and for output, right? We, there's a something that I find to be so interesting about living here in uh, Japan is, um, you know, it's kind of shocking how many Japanese people will say that they don't know English, but as soon as they have a drink or they're they're in a like a relaxing social environment and they're communicating, as soon as they have that and that filter is gone, suddenly they speak English so well. So I guess my advice is to just find what works for you. Um, try as many different things as possible, communication classes, uh, try the memorization if that works for you, try to try to look at the sort of rules of that language, the grammar rules and see if that works to take it from a sort of mathematical approach. Um, it, it's kind of individual, I think. I hope that helps a little. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for the, for the explanation. Yeah. One little yeah. more advice that I would like to add uh, to what Miss Smith uh, has just said, uh, Frank, is to try the natural language uh, uh, system or philosophy, so to speak. Uh, what happens is uh, if you are uh, evolving within uh, an environment where the language has to be used every instant. Mm -hmm. This makes the process far easier than if you are, let's say, remotely trying to get chunks of language from books, videos, and so forth and so on. So for people who have issues to be in that kind of environment, one advice that I love to uh, provide them with is to uh, forcibly watch, for example, shows in the target language. Let's say you want to learn uh, English, uh, and then you know you don't have the language as of yet, but uh, try to uh, push to uh, get inside that environment by watching a movie one hour two hours you don't understand uh, the language but at least uh, you know you're not blind you can see exactly what's going on uh, the people who are moving from one uh, spot to another what they do so little by little i guarantee you brother after about a month you're gonna see some improvement because uh, the types of gestures that the people make, the, 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 the settings that they are moving within, you're going to get a, mm -hmm. a clue, you're going to get a hint what's going on, and then little by little, you're going to uh, acquire and learn some words here, some uh, phrases there, some complete sentences there, 
Uh, as I said again, if you give mm -hmm. this a try, you're going to see something happen within a month. The, the natural language process. So uh, try that and you let us know if that works for you. Uh, yeah, I question, think also you know, being in this environment now. We've been having that issue of that audio issue with Arjo Kiko, but that participant uh, jumps in into the chat line and asks, what is the appropriate time age for uh, learning a second language and is it consistent in making it as a daily bread? That is the question from Ajo. I don't know if you have a take on that. Let me uh, reread again what uh, that participant wrote. What is the appropriate Please, yeah. time age for learning a second language? And is it consistent in making it as a daily bread? I don't know if you have a take on that, Ms. Smith. <laughs> um, so I think I mentioned earlier, but I do think earlier is better. Uh -huh. But that isn't to say that if you're 24, 38, or I don't know, 46, that you just shouldn't try to learn another language. Um, okay. So. I would say that it's it's worth a shot to 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 make it a part of your daily habit, um, no matter what age you are. But if you're looking to to say you have children and you want uh, your child to be a wonderful language learner, you want to teach them early because if I find that people who are bilingual, who know a second language, uh, tend to learn a third language, a fourth language, a fifth language, uh, kind of easier and faster because they're developing a stronger sense of meta-linguistic sort of awareness, which is basically, they kind of, they have a better grasp of, of how language differs between each language mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> or how rules differ between each language, um, that they're able to kind of look at language from more of an outside perspective rather than from within. I hope that makes sense, <laughs> but yes, I do find yes. that, yes. yeah, it becomes easier. So the earlier someone learns a second language, the better Better. And the better they'll be at learning a third language or a fourth language or a fifth language, for sure. Yes. Uh, we don't have too much time left. As a matter of fact, uh, we have already run out of time. But uh, uh, before we go to Christopher Pierre in the, uh, among the participants, uh, let's go quickly to a niche. I don't know if there is a response to that from uh, Askar uh, Sinchukwa, uh, who is telling us that uh, he is uh, very much interested in this topic of uh, learning second language. Uh, that's all okay. the, the participant wrote. So uh, uh, I don't know if I may phrase this question in, in a different way, Ms. Smith. As you are all the way in Japan, I don't know if you have a website, if you have some way to, uh, let's say, interact further with our participants, if there is somehow that you can possibly yeah. provide some uh, additional input uh, about this second language learning process. Ah, there we go, brother. Yeah. Oh, um, so. I'm sorry, so you're saying- Yeah, the student is uh, telling us that uh, he's very much interested in this topic, but of course, if he's interested in, in the topic, that's definitely not for now, since uh, we are about to uh, wrap up this session. But my question to you is, uh, if you have a way for our students to uh, keep uh, interacting yeah. with you, if you have a website, I'm looking at uh, uh, your- uh screen right now your email address do you allow them to uh, uh, communicate with you by that email address on the screen right now to uh, further 
uh, get into this topic with you? Yes, yeah, feel free um, to send me an email. I would love to answer any questions or point you to any resources that you might um, be able to uh, get into. And then I also would like to suggest further reading. Mm -hmm. um, let me just make sure I get the author's name. Yeah. And before, okay, we... um, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. So um, again, feel free to email me any questions that you have. Um, I want to give a book recommendation uh, to everybody. Um, but let's see what I do, everyone. Okay, so I, re I highly recommend if you would like to learn more about second language acquisition and theories, there's this book here called How Languages Are Learned. And it's from Nina Spada and Patsy Light Brown. And I'll add it in the chat. This is a great book to learn about um, all of these theories. Um, it's a really great way to introduce you to, to that. And a, a lot of the information that I actually got for the slide came from this. This is how I learned about second language acquisition. Um, my very first uh, sort of experience with second language acquisition came from this book. Um, Wonderful. So now I'm applying it to my life here. Yeah. Okay. Our language I learn, ladies and gentlemen, the book uh, being recommended by our presenter, Ms. Uh, Mel Smith, uh, Our Language. Our Languages I Learn by Nina Spada and Patsy Light Brown. If you allow me, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, I did uh, make a pledge to allow Christopher Pierre to ask that of question. Course. That's going to be the last, but uh, go ahead, uh, Christopher. Uh, uh, we are listening to you at this time. Christopher Pierre. Uh, there is a problem with your audio. Hello? Okay, there we go. There we go. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, I thank you so much. Thank you um, to give me uh, the opportunity to take part in this meeting. I think it's a nice one because I learned a lot from you. But I don't really have a question, first of all, but I just have a comment. And I remember back in the years when I learned English. It was very difficult because some of the time when I when I learn a word to practice it, to use it, it was not easy. This is what, what we did. I have some colleague and the same school with me. We 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 put in place an English club. And mm -hmm. every afternoon after class or after work, we just you know, for gathered in the place where we we went for the club and we keep talking only in english we we mm -hmm. we come with a subject we give the homework between us not a professor mm -hmm. we are the professor we give their homework and we go to make the research and after that we come with the research and we discuss it in english but I thought it was a nice way to keep in touch with English and also practice it. And then, mm -hmm. because me and my, my native language is Creole and French, and I think it is not easy, especially when you are not living in a country where you speak the, uh, this language. Some of the time you speak this, uh, uh, for example, English. The other time you speak your your native language or of your official language, that that is the biggest the biggest problem for learners a, 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 a mm -hmm. foreign language because you need that. And if I have a question, I would like to ask. There is an I think if 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 there is a a, a class an English class or we 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 keep we can where we can keep talking about the English. How can I practice it and also see if we can keep in touch? I think I will be I will be very happy to take part in this English class. Class, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Was... I actually we were 
so this kind of gets back into the immersion thing um, that Dr. Valsine, Valsine. Okay, well, yeah, sorry, I just wanna make sure I was pronouncing it right. Um, so Dr. Valsin was talking about, about that immersion, like being around the input, hearing, you know, uh, English on television, being around it, kind of picking it up. You need to kind of replicate that. If you, if you don't have access to a full English environment, you need to try to replicate that as much as possible. So what uh, you were doing with having this sort of English club where everyone has to speak English and only English, it's kind of creating like a, I guess like a, a false, not really false, but sort of immersion uh, sort of environment. Yes. Um, so again, like uh, communication is really important. Having the, the chance to only use uh, that output. I actually have a recommendation for an application that sort of, uh, that you could use if you have a smartphone, um, or I think it, they have a website, but there's something called Hello Talk, and it kind of creates that that um, sort of immersion in a way, where you are only speaking with other people who speak your target language, um, that want to learn your native language, and in a way you're exchanging. Um, language with each other and you can correct each other's uh, English or French or Spanish or whatever language you're, you're learning. So if you haven't used HelloTalk, I do highly recommend it. Some people um, have really, really seen some positive results uh, with sort of creating immersion um, using that. So I'm trying to download the application right now at the same time and see if I can get it on my phone. Because sometimes so busy, okay. but even when you say that, just get, just try to do it at the same time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you. It was a very yeah, insightful uh, comment uh, from you, uh, Christopher. And we are, ladies and gentlemen, getting to that point where we will be wrapping up this uh, very, very awesome presentation by Miss uh, uh, Smith. Uh, her email address is currently on the screen, so as she allows you, uh, you may uh, feel free to uh, send her questions and comments and whatever it is that can help you with uh, your activity or endeavor to uh, practice language learning or language acquisition. So, uh, Miss uh, Smith, uh, you've been really uh, outstanding. I love every <laughs> of that presentation uh, from you, and I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the Paul Institution of Atlantic International University. And I hope uh, you will respond in the future for other invitations to talk to our audience about uh, language learning, language acquisition. The last word from you, Miss Smith. Yeah, um, I guess everyone, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please uh, feel free to contact me with questions. I would be so happy to answer them. Don't be shy, practice English. Uh, you know, maybe emailing me your questions is a good way to practice in English. So um, I'd be happy to answer those. And I appreciate all of the participation from everybody. Thank you so much. You. And good luck with uh, your language journey. Thank you very much again. Let's mm. uh, all together, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, your microphones you. are on right now. Say thank you to Miss Mel Smith. Thank it's you. been a thank real you. pleasure. You've enjoyed thank your you. attendance. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.